OK, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, fantastic that uh, all of you can, could do it today, although the, in some places there are some holiday season. Great, great to have you here today. So topic for today's webinar is um, Antipro BNP, uh, which is also a well-known biomarker from, from PassFast. So this time we decided to go with this uh, scientific biomarker since this biomarker just recently or in the, in the in the past gained more and more attendance also from the scientific community so more and more publications and scientific evaluations arise here so then that's the reason we decided to go with a specific topic on on this biomarker for today so today we have a speaker from switzerland which is uh, dr Dilire Wusler. Um, the topic or the, the, the title of, of the presentation for today is Antiprobnp Scientific and Clinical Relevance of this Biomarker. So within the frame of this presentation today, we will learn uh, a lot of things about this biomarker. For instance, again, the basic application of Antiprobnp in a clinical use. We will hear some information about the diagnostic and prognostic power of this biomarker as well. We will learn about more important recent studies and new findings about and applications of antipro BNP. And of course, experiences uh, from, from the field also with this biomarkers in the frame from, for some, some uh, case studies, okay? So maybe before we start, uh, let me, let me uh, say some words about uh, Dr. Wusler. So Dr. Wusler is an internal medicine specialist and cardiology expert. Uh, currently working in uh, interventional cardiology at the University Hospital of Basel. So this, this uh, researcher group, um, I suppose most of you will remember, um, has, has um, did all the elevation for our new zero to our algorithm for, for PASFAST troponin. So here we have a really well, well known and, and quite a famous group. And we are very proud to have uh, Dr. Wusler today for the uh, for the topic on antipro BNP. OK, so more than that, Dr. Wusler, she did several trainings in internal medicine and cardiology at several institutions, for instance, in uh, Germany at the University Heart Center in Freiburg and also, of course, in Switzerland in the University of Basel, University Hospital of Basel. OK, and as already explained, so this researcher group has just recently um, developed the, the new zero to our algorithm for PASFAST troponin. OK, so basically she concentrated her research in clinical cardiology, um, which will focus on more uh, the diagnostic risk prediction and early treatment of acute uh, heart failure and myocardial infarction. OK, cardiac biomarker and sex specific differences in cardiovascular disease. OK. So regarding her um, scientific background, so she authored and co-authored around 100 scientific publications in peer-reviewed international journals. Okay, so very, very. Uh, so, we, so now with Dr. Wusser, we have really a, a real expert on 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 the field of antipro BNP and heart insufficiency for today. Okay, so before we start, let me just again state the rules for for today's meeting. So all of you are, of course, um, um, please um, state all, all your questions that might arise during this uh, presentation from Dr. Wusler. State all your, all your questions in our Q&A section here in, in, the, in the Teams program, OK? So we will have um, time enough um, when, when Dr. Wusler will finish you know, to, to go over all these questions, OK? So please feel free, just state everything in, in, in this uh, chat uh, 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 function Q&A here, OK? So at the end of the presentation, we will then go through them uh, one by one, OK? So then I wish you a very interesting uh, uh, lecture for today on antipro BNP, and I would like to hand over now to Dr. Wusler. OK, so please, Desiree, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, for this nice introduction. Dear colleagues, dear participants, I'm glad to talk about antiprobian pain heart failure today. In my opinion, a biomarker which leads to greater accuracy and diagnosis of our heart failure patients 
and therefore also to greater accuracy in therapy. So these are my disclosures and I will start this talk with a quite general question. So in which patients should we use anti-proBNP and also a little provocative, do we really need anti-proBNP? And in my opinion, of course, we need this biomarker and we should measure it in all patients with suspected heart failure. And this is also in accordance with the current ESC guidelines. So the 2021 ESC guideline give a 1B recommendation on the measurement of anti-proBNP in suspected heart failure. To give you a little bit more details about that, I brought two um, flowcharts or diagnostic algorithms from the guidelines. So on the left side, you see the diagnostic algorithm for stable and ambulatory heart failure patients. And on the right side, for new onset heart failure for acute decompensation. So in all of this, if you suspect heart failure in the patients you're seeing, for example, in the emergency department, you should measure anti-proBNP. You see it here and you see it also here as natriuretic peptides. So when should we suspect heart failure? This is a really important question because this leads us to the measurement of anti-proBNP. So typical signs and symptoms of heart failures are very important. And in my opinion, the most typical or more often, often sign I see in heart failure patients is acute dyspnea, especially when you have an acute decompensation. But also a stable and ambulatory patient could tell you that he has this terrible fatigue and this absolute exercise intolerance. So these are also typical symptoms for heart failure. And in this point, it's also very important that anti-proBNP it's not a standalone me measurement in heart failure patients. It's, it's part of a whole package. So you should measure this biomarker, but you should also do a physical examination of your patient. You should do an ECG, you should do a chest X-ray, all the things you see here to have a complete picture of your patient and have the right diagnosis afterwards. So to give you a little bit more clinical background and make it a little bit more plastic. I brought you a case presentation and I will talk about a 76 year old gentleman who presented with acute dyspnea to our emergency department and I was the consulted cardiologist for this patient. And he told me that he had this dyspnea since the day before and he had a lot of cough and um, excessive sputum production. And he also told me that he is used to dyspnea. He usually has dyspnea on exertion, but never at rest. And this was also very frightening for him. From our hospital charts, we, charts, we knew that this patient had known coronary artery disease. He had undergone cabbage some years ago, and he had also COPD and was known for chronic bilateral lymphedema. We did a physical examination and got his vital signs and he had a quite high respiratory rate. He had fever. His pulse and his blood pressure were within a normal range and also his oxygen saturation was okay. We did a physical examination and of course we noted this tachypnea on auscultation. He had no reels but a prolonged experience and we also heard some wheezing. We couldn't really judge his neck veins, but we objectified some mild ankle edema. But the patient told us that this were his usual edema because he had this chronic lymphedema, so nothing new from this point. So what to do next, what to do with this patient? We made up some potential deferential diagnosis. What, what could be the reason for his acute dyspnea? So because of his history of COPD and this auscultation finding of a prolonged experience and also of the wheezing, we saw hmm, maybe he has a COPD exacerbation. This would be like a really good explanation for his acute dyspnea. But on the other hand, we also know, know that um, he has coronary artery disease, he has undergone cabbage, so maybe because of this acute dyspnea, he has acute heart failure. This is the other differential diagnosis. And what I also said, this patient also had fever. 
and he had dyspnea. So maybe pneumonia would also be a differential diagnosis. And because of the acute onset of the dyspnea, pulmonary embolism would be a differential diagnosis, but it's not very likely if you see the whole picture of this patient. So what to do next? What did we do? We obtained an ECG of the patient and you see sinus rhythm and a known left bundle branch block. So nothing new on his ECG, no signs of an acute ischemia. And as a next step, we did a chest X-ray and we saw of the differential diagnosis pneumonia, but in this chest X-ray, we couldn't see an infiltrate. So pneumonia wasn't very likely anymore. What we saw in this chest X-ray were some mild signs of con congestion, and therefore we ordered an anti-proBNP. And this anti-proBNP was 5,000 in this case, which led us to the most likely diagnosis of acute heart failure. And this patient was admitted to the ward with the diagnosis of acute heart failure. So um, I will explain some more about the differential diagnosis, about some take home messages from this case later on. But first, I want to go back to the biomarkers. So according to the guidelines, which other biomarkers besides anti-proBNP could we have measured in this patient? So as I said, um, he had this known history of coronary artery disease, but in the most recent presentation, he didn't complain about chest pain or anything. If he had complained about chest pain, we would have for sure ordered entropinin to exclude um, an acute coronary syndrome. And if we had, were, if we were more suspicious about um, a pulmonary embolism, we would have for sure ordered a D-dimer. And if this potential diagnosis of pneumonia would have been more likely, of course, we would have ordered a procalcitonin. And this would be kind of a multi-marker approach we could have used in this patient. So let's move on to this take home messages. I told you this patient had fever and signs of a systemic infection, but he, not ha he didn't have pneumonia. But later on, we, we also found out that he had a urinary tract infection. And what we really should keep in mind is that fever or an infection are typical triggers of acute heart failure. And another very important point, we had this auscultation finding of wheezing and a prolonged experience. And this, these kind of led us to the story of an COPD exacerbation, but we should really keep in mind that obstructive auscultation finding could be to pulmonary congestion, which is due to acute heart failure. And we call this cardiac asthma or asthma cardiale. And what you also saw is that anti pro BNP played a really important role here to find um, a good explanation for the patient's dyspnea. And this leads us back to the beginning that we should order an anti pro BNP for every patient who is presenting with symptoms suggestive of acute heart failure. And in this case, the acute dyspnea is a really high suspicious finding for acute heart failure and the measurement of anti pro BNP. So I will go on with the next point on the agenda. When should we measure anti pro BNP? So what is the optimal time point to measure this biomarker? And for our emergency department, it's quite clear and also the guidelines are very clear about it. If we suspect heart failure, we should measure it on presentation. So when you see the patient in the emergency department or when you see him in the ambulatory care clinic, you should measure the anti pro BNP when you suspect heart failure. And in our emergency department, this is even triggered by the nurses according to our local standard opera operating procedures. So Let's go back to this ED scenario and how important it is to measure anti pro BNP. I, I will show you, in my opinion, a very important viewpoint, which was published in the European Journal of Heart Failure in 2021. 
It's about the Peptide for Life initiative. And this viewpoint really points out nicely the importance of anti pro BNP in patients with acute dyspnea. It makes a conclusion of several studies which measured anti pro BNP in patients with acute dyspnea. And all of these studies showed that with the measurements of naturally peptides, the rate of hospitalization decreased, there were less admissions to cardiology, less admissions to ICU, and also the total length of stay of our patients could, re could be reduced. And this is like a really, it's a safer approach for our patients, and it's also leading to less costs because we had less inpatient management, and also we had a shorter length of stay. So there's no doubt about the importance of anti pro BNP in acute heart failure and also in the emergency department. So this viewpoint also showed, and this was really surprising for me, it shows this graph and you see here the number of hospitals with an availability of BNP in the emergency department per million people. And we see that Germany is, is doing pretty good. So there are a lot of emergency departments where you can measure an anti pro BNP. But despite this high recommendation of the, our European Society of Cardiology guidelines, not in every European country you have the chance to measure anti pro BNP in the, in the emergency department. And I think this is really something that has to change because there's no doubt about the necessity of measuring anti pro BNP. So I brought you here another picture of a diagnostic approach we should do in suspected heart failure. So you have typical signs and symptoms of acute heart failure. You done, have done your ECG, your chest X-ray, and also you did um, an anti pro BNP, and then you have the working diagnosis of acute heart failure. And this again points out it's not only the single measurement of anti pro BNP, you should really gain a holistic picture of your patient to make the correct diagnosis. And if you have the working diagnosis of AHF, you should initiate therapy, which is most of the time diuretic therapy. And especially if it's the first episode of your patient in which he has acute heart failure, so the first acute decompensation, you have to consult a cardiologist to do an echocardiography. And this is of central importance because we really want to characterize the phenotype of heart failure. So you see it here below. Um, is it heart failure because you have a reduced ejection fraction? Is it heart failure because you have a valvular heart disease? Is it isolated right heart failure? Or does your patient have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? And all this etiologies lead to an elevated anti pro BNP and they have different therapy approaches and this is why it is so important to do also an echocardiography. So I want to spend some words on pathophysiology of anti pro BNP. We won't spend here for ages but um, I think to have a specific understanding and to have some logical explanation for this biomarker it's also important about to know about the generation, why is it elevated, what's going on in our heart. So the first reason for uh, elevated natriuretic peptides is elevated filling pressure, volume overload, wall stress, all having an impact of our cardiomyocytes. And this leads to the production of the precursors of anti-pro BNP and BNP. And why do we have this evaluated filling pressures, this volume overload and wall stress now? This is all because of left or right ventricular dysfunction. This could be heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but also heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Another possibility for evaluated filling pressures is, for example, valvular heart disease. So, if we have this and have this pro BNP now, it will be by enzymes, it will be separated into anti pro BNP and BNP. And anti pro BNP has a longer half time, as you can see here, and it's the biologically 
inactive part of the natriuretic peptides. The active hormone is the BNP. It leads to natriuresis and vasodilation and all the things that should help you to give a little release of this elevated filling pressures and also volume overload and wall stress. And BNP has a quite shorter half-life than anti-pro-BNP and the effect of renal dysfunction on anti-pro-BNP is higher than on BNP. And here you see another very important point in times when we use sacupril valsartan in patients with heart failure and reduce ejection fraction because um, sacupril is an inhibitor of neprizolin and neprizolin is the enzyme which kind of breaks down BNP to its inactive fragments. And of course, if you inhibit this enzyme, BNP will be higher, which leads to higher BNP levels in patients who are on sacupril valsartan. So let's move on to the next point. These are cutoffs for anti-pro BNP. So when is this biomarker elevated and also potential pitfalls of, of natriuretic peptides, which are especially important in our emergency departments. So this is an overview of the cutoffs. And you see on this side, anti-pro BNP and BNP. And what is very important is that you differentiate between the acute setting. So an acute decompensation of your patients, for example, with acute dyspnea, acute volume overload, or if you measure it in a stable and ambulatory patients. So of course, we will ex expect that the values are much higher and an acute decompensation much higher than in a stable patient. And this is also what you see here in the cutoffs. So if heart failure is unlikely, for example, in an ambulatory patient, the anti-pro BNP should be below 125. If it is likely, it is above 600. And similar things um, are found here for the acute setting, but with much higher cutoffs. And for anti-pro BNP, we also saw here, and this is also in the guidelines, that there's a certain impact of age. And this is suspected that it's because of a correlation of renal dysfunction and age. And this is why you have in older patients higher cutoffs than in younger patients. So what are potential pitfalls for these biomarkers? So they can be lower than expected in some scenarios. This can be, for example, in a pericardial tamponade. This can be in an acute mitral regurgitation, or this can also be the case in obesity. So in obesity, when you have a quite low BNP or anti-pro BNP, which is kind of in the observed zone and you're not sure, is it heart failure? Most likely it is heart failure because the BNP or anti-pro BNP is lower in obese patient. Where can it be higher than expected? This is what we already talked about. The kidney function has really an impact on this biomarker. And if you have terminal kidney disease, the values will be higher than expected. Last but not least, and in my opinion of really central importance, is risk stratification and also prognostic relevance of patients with acute heart failure. And anti-pro BNP plays an important role here. This is on the left side, you see a publication which is already more than 10 years old. But even then, we already knew that, that there's an inverse relationship between anti-pro BNP and mortality. So in this study, patients with a really high anti-pro BNP, you see it also here, had a worse survival compared to patients with lower levels. So the higher the anti-pro BNP, the worse the outcome. And there we saw the anti-pro BNP as a single marker for prognosis and risk stratification. But in acute heart failure, we always aim to have a more holistic picture of our patients. And that is why we use risk scores to give an opinion about the prognosis of our patients. And one of this risk score, which we 
externally validated in our basal cohort is the messy acute heart failure risk score. And this score um, has very high accuracy in the prediction of 30-day mortality of AHF patients. And one of the biomarkers in this score is, of course, anti-proBNP. Also, troponin is in included in this score and several clinical parameters, for example, systolic blood pressure or the respiratory rate of our patients. So, in my opinion, it's really important to have a combination of clinical signs and symptoms and biomarkers and to combine them in a score to give a good prognostication and also an early risk stratification of patients with heart failure. To conclude this talk, so we talked about in which patients shall we use anti -ProBNP, and it's quite clear. So you should use it in all patients with suspected heart failure. And as acute dyspnea is a really typical sign and symptom of acute heart failure, you should use it in every patient with acute dyspnea. And this is an ESC class 1B recommendation. And when should we use this biomarker? This was also quite clear. We should use it up in presentation. So when we see the patient and when we suspect heart failure, we should measure an anti -pro BNP. And re with regards to the pathophysiology, we now know that the elevated wall stress and volume overload leads to the production of natriuretic peptides. And we also talked about the cutoffs and pitfalls, and especially about obesity, which leads to lower natriuretic peptide values than we would expect. And last but not least, very important risk stratification and also prognostic relevance of the biomarker. And in my opinion, for mortality prediction and acute heart failure and for risk stratification, you should combine biomarkers with clinical signs and symptoms. And in the best case, you have a heart failure risk score to give an accurate mortality and risk prediction for your heart failure patient. I conclude with this take home messages and I'm very happy to answer your questions. Very good. Thank you so much, Deirdre, for this excellent presentation. Very, very informative, super comprehensive. Thank you. Uh, no, very good. And uh, yeah, so then I would like to ask our audience to state questions that might have arose now during this presentation. So please feel free to state any kind of questions in our Q&A channel here, please. While they are doing this, maybe um, Desiree, maybe I can I can mm. state a question or oh, maybe maybe we have some. Do we? No. No. OK, so what I was what I found was really interesting when you when you explained uh, the effect from sagubitril. You know, this is mm -hmm. a nebulizine inhibitor, well known. Of course, what, what I was wondering about is how often is this kind of heart insufficiency drug really used or really in used? I mean, mm -hmm. I remember there, there, are, there are different ones, right? But only for this, this specific e effect has been described, right? By, of course, um, somehow putting, put, putting in, 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 in the off the BNP biomarker in comparison to the anti-pro BNP, if, if I understood correctly. So this could also be an argument, um, as far as I understood, to prefer using the anti-pro BNP assay instead of the BNP one. Is this correct? Or what is your experience with this? How often is this really in use in a, in a clinical practice? Yes, thank you for this important question, Frank. Um, so we use Zacopril-Razatan only for patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. So it's mm -hmm. it's is it in half path patients, so when the ejection fraction is normal but they have diastolic dysfunction, there's not a clear recommendation. There are no studies that really show that there's a mortality benefit of sacrifil and that's why it's only used in the half ref patients. And not every patient is able to tolerate sacrifil because it has a certain, in some patients, really high effect on blood pressure. So they mm -hmm. have problems with tolerating this drug, but 
the aim in, in, in accordance to the guidelines, and this is also a class one recommendation, if your patient has half ref, you should try to change him from an ACE inhibitor to Zacopril-Rosatan because this has more, more power, the, they have like a better effect on mortality. And of course, what you yeah. also said, and which is right, that this puts the BNP a little bit in the off. Is, yeah, because I remember true. from from the past, um, there was there was a time really, I mean, anti pro BNP has has been the one in the past, right, and, and the only one. But then there was also a time when really the other biomarker BNP with a shorter mm -hmm. half life, etc., also mm -hmm. came up. Um, and then some people say, okay, BNP is better, and some others say, okay, anti pro BNP is better. And and then at some point this this debate uh, with this um, yeah niprilzine inhibitor came came into place um, somehow enforcing then maybe uh, preferring using the the anti pro BNP assay instead no so this is yeah so but I was wondering you, from the yeah, past you know, yeah yeah if your patient is on cyclopyrazatan you shouldn't use BNP you should use anti pro BNP uh, of course okay yeah very very good. Uh, good argument, great. So I have now one question for you, Desiree, from, from our chat. And it mm -hmm. says here, please give some comments, tip of anti-pro BNP as a therapy monitoring marker. Hours, days. It's stated mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this is also a very important point. Thank you for this question. Um, so these biomarkers are kind of continuous. So you have an elevation right at the decompensation. For example, I sometimes see patients who have an anti-pro BNP of 30 of 30,000, which is which is really really high in an acute decompensation. And if you really feel that if you give diuretics and the patient is losing a lot of fluid and a lot of weight, then if you see that, then I would measure it maybe at that point when you see it. It's most of the time in the hospital. It's after three days, after five days. It always depends on how decompensated your patient is, of course. And what is, in my opinion, also really important, if you had this acute decompensation, you should measure another anti-pro BNP when your patient is really recompensated before you discharge your patient to home. Because when he comes again with acute dyspnea, you kind of want to compare you want to know what is the baseline anti-pro BNP of this patient. And if he goes home with 5,000, okay, maybe he has a real bad ejection fraction, maybe he has a valvular problem, that's why the value is 5,000. But if he comes back with 20,000, you know, okay, he's decompensated again. But if he comes back with 6,000, then you maybe say, oh, maybe he's not decompensated and 6,000 is high, but it's kind of his baseline. Mm -hmm. And that is why I think it's really important to have kind of the baseline value for each patient. And this is really different from patient to patient. Okay, understood. Interesting. So are there any other questions from, from our audience? P please feel free at any time to, to, to state them right now. So maybe just while we are waiting. So Desiree, mm -hmm. I have just one more question. So. You already mentioned that, or you, you touched that slightly with this kind of multi-marker approach you, you could also recommend. Um, from, from your clinical experience out there in the field, um, how, how do you handle this in, in a clinical practice? I mean, it, do you really see a, a clear benefit, for instance, as, as anybody knows here, so PassFast is really able to do exactly this, this kind of multi-marker approach. So being able to combine the anti-pro BNP assay with a high sensitivity troponin, we could add a D-dimer and of course also as, as you proposed a, a PCT assay. Would you see a, a clear benefit here, for instance, having them uh, for a kind of first staging of a patient in the emergency setting, in emergency department? Thank you to for have the benef benefit of, of time, I mean, you know, for mm -hmm. a first really good triaging, also mm -hmm. to include or exclude the heart insufficiency in combination with other biomarkers. So, for instance, mm -hmm. somebody is dropping in with shortness of breath, right? So, for me, you no, know, could be a really a clear advantage have all these biomarkers available, mm -hmm. you no, know, for instance, from whole blood in, in a very short time. How mm -hmm. do you see this role for, for PASFAST and its biomarkers here? 
Thank you for this question. So um, when I, I, I can, can explain it now from our emergency department, what we do. And yes. at the moment, it's like, so we really decide what do we want to know from a patient. Or, and mm -hmm. if you order a D-dimer, and in most of these heart failure patients, the D-dimer will be high because it's, I, I think in 90% when I order a D-dimer, it's high. And when it's high, you have to do a CT with contrast to exclude pulmonary embolism. This is a consequence. And this is why we in our emergency department, we are super restricted with a D-dimer because of mm -hmm. the consequence of a CT. But I think the combination, if you have, for example, a myocardial infarction, or you have, for example, Takotsubo, which is mm -hmm. also like this stress cardiomyopathy, if I can say it like that very easily, then mm -hmm. it would be useful to combine um, a troponin and a BNP in, in this patient than to have it really fast because you also want to know about the wall stress, about the decompensation. Mm -hmm. This is, in my opinion, a, ve a very good combination. Um, with regards to the procalcitonin, also, but maybe this is a basal thing, we are kind of restrictive with a procalcitonin because mm -hmm. um, that's in our lab. They say it costs a lot of money. I'm, I'm not a laboratory yeah. physician. I don't know. So we mm -hmm. are really restrictive and we only do it when we have kind of the feeling that is, it could be a pneumonia, it could be a really bacterial inf infection to decide, shall we start with antibiotics, shall we not? So we are at the moment are rather restrictive. But I think on the other hand, the combination of troponin and anti pro BNP is a really good combination. And sometimes if you have a patient who is really in shock and where you don't know what, what's going on with this patient, of course, it can be helpful to measure several biomarkers in one time to really fastly exclude things and have the good diagnosis. So I think for one, some patients, it for sure it's beneficial, but not for all. But I think that's how it is in medicine. You don't have this one approach. You have different things and always you have to decide in which patient to use what. Yeah, this is true, especially as you already explained. So what, what I also learned is also regarding risk uh, prediction and prognosis. It's really helpful sometimes to have a high sensitivity troponin assay and anti anti pro BNP in a combination no? mm. to say something about yes. not the prognosis for the patient. No? Of this, course. Is, this is yes. right. Yes. Super. Um, I have another question here, uh, Desiree, and it says here the combo test no? troponin anti pro BNP D dimer is very useful in terms of PC solution. But that how often what does this mean? How often? Maybe it's meant here. How often you you have this in, in a clinical practice? I don't understand. Do you understand this question? No, how and often? I don't understand the combin. What is meant with the combination? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they mean antiprobin P, uh, troponin, and D dimer. But basically, you you just explained. Right? Yes, so. I think so. Yes. Okay. Okay, yeah, please. Uh, any other questions for, for Desiree? Please feel free to, to state them now. Oh, here is something. Can I? One second, I need to refresh the Q&A session. No worries. Where is this? Is it the one um, below the other? Is it, yeah, it says, or is it mainly mm. used as a diagnostic marker? Yeah, for, for me, it does not appear in the Q&A, but mm. something here, and it's very small, but let me try. Okay, is it mainly used as a diagnostic marker? Ah, okay. So, so this is this is the point here, Desiree. Mm. I, I, I think, yes, of course, but please, yeah. It's, yeah. So, the first thing is, of course, diagnostic, or it's it's really, really useful. That's what we discussed in the last 30 minutes. But mm -hmm. it's also prognostic. And what we also know, and we are working on analysis of that, is that um, 
the antiprobian PU measure at admission and the antiprobian PU measure at discharge, that the discharge value is even more accurate for prognosis than the admission value because it has some relevance that you see how is the antiprobian P going down? Is it still very high when the patient is recompensated? And mm -hmm. this has really an impact on prognosis. And we are working on some on some analysis of this. And these are the things we we want to go deeper in. So in my opinion, of course, diagnosis really really important, but also for prognosis. So both mm -hmm. fields. Okay. Okay. Understood. Very good. Okay. So maybe one last call for further questions. So is there any other questions for, for Desiree for today? Please state this now. I don't think we do not have more questions here as far as I see. Ah, here there's something sorry uh, it's it's coming later <laughs> now i have it so here we have uh, thank you for excellent lecture what is your opinion can we rely on anti-pro bnp changes in patients with attr cardiomyopathy on tafamidis okay so this is this is for you Daisy. i have no idea <laughs> so yeah. um the, other, the question is about amyloidosis and attr mm -hmm. is one kind of amyloidosis and what is the, just to explain it for anyone who doesn't know anything about amyloidosis, there's like some proteins which which are not really folded correctly, just to make it easy. And they are also like in, in your heart, they go into your heart muscle and they make it really, really stiff. So the heart muscle has a problem to, to relax. Um, and this leads to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, so to a massive diastolic dysfunction. And these patients also have very high antiprobian P values because of the diastolic dysfunction. And tafamidis is a quite new drug. I, I think we use it maybe for two, three years. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, and it should help in the special ATTR amyloidosis. But I don't think that there's any trial or analysis which shows that... Um, Antiprobian P is not reliable when you are on tefamidis. So I, I don't think that there's, there's an, an analysis of, about it. And I don't see a reason why antiprobian P shouldn't be reliable. Okay. Interesting. I never heard about this, about tefamidis. Seems to be quite new. Okay. Nice. Okay. Thank you, Desiree. So any, any other questions? Last call for... for Questions, please state it now. I do not see any other questions right now. Okay, if there are no more questions, I would like to end the meeting for today, saying thank you to to all of you for 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 joining this this interesting meeting, and of course, Deidre, thank thank you so much for this excellent talk and very informative, comprehensive one. And um, yeah. Then I would like to, to end the meeting now and say goodbye uh, to anyone and hope to see you next time in our next uh, webinar. Okay, so then have a good day and yeah, see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.